The Roaring Twenties was a daring time in the 20th century as Western civilization saw a massive paradigm shift in cultural values, social liberty, economic growth, and artistic and innovative expansions. If the Roaring Twenties could be personified as one person, then that would be Tamara de la Pica. The manifestation of newfound women's liberty and the biggest influencer on the Art Deco style, she broke the barriers of the art scene and proved that women can paint just as good as men, and just as provocative too. Welcome to Nutty History. Today we're looking back at the wicked life of an artist named Tamara de Lampica in the 20th century. The Fable of the Supreme Mother In February of 2021, every art enthusiast in the world was surprised to learn about the new entry on the top 10 impressionists and modern lots sold in this decade. A glamorous ode to a Parisian cabaret chanteuse, Portrait de Marjorie Ferry was sold for a grand $21.1 million, pushing it to number eight on the list. Until now, the name Tamara de Lempica was only renowned among certain insiders and devotees of the Art Deco era. She was basically considered just a side note in the global art market. Obviously, it was a severe injustice, given her contribution to Cubism, Modernism, and of course the Art Deco movement. She had stood shoulder to shoulder with artists like Picasso and Dali, and yet a century later her work is mostly forgotten, unlike her male peers. Her peak work has been collected for decades by celebrities like music legends Barbara Streisand and Madonna, as well as a generation-defining actor Jack Nicholson, who prefers her later work that she did in America. That phase of Lempica's craft was quite contrasting to her bad girl reputation that she earned during her time in Paris, and it all started with the Supreme Mother, who we'll talk about right now. Tamara told the world she was born in 1898 in Warsaw, Poland, in a wealthy Catholic Polish family. However, after an untimely end to her parents' marriage, she spent most of her teen years with her grandmother, who spoiled her by taking her on trips to every Western European country possible. That developed her early interests in art. However, despite being born into an elite family, life didn't hand her everything on a silver platter. She was a liberalistic personality who swung on both sides of the lover's lane and expressed her passion and desires both artistically and literally. But the political climate of early 20th century Europe didn't much agree with her. She had to first flee the Bolshevik Revolution, and then 20 years later, she urged her second husband to move to Europe before people with black swastika armbands would be knocking on her door. This was a pretty hard time for her, and she had to deal with depression. Her then-husband, Baron Raoul Kuffner, suggested she spend some time in the spa resort of Salsa Maggiore, Italy. While she sought relief and treatment at the quaint little town at the foot of the Alpenines, she found an urge to reconnect with her Catholic roots and knocked on the door of a convent in Parma. In several later interviews, Tamara mentioned that she was received by an abbess who went by the title Mother Superior. Tamara claimed that the Mother Superior just stared at her with a look that contained all the sufferings in the world. She further asserted that after they moved to New York, she rented a dusty old apartment near Ritz where she was staying to paint and Mother Superior visited her there for three weeks. The two women talked and Tamara painted a portrait of her and just like she had appeared in the sitting chair, the Mother Superior disappeared into thin air after the painting was complete. The Mother Superior most likely did exist and her name was Mother Therese Delphine of the Daughters of the Cross. However, the French nun never went to the Americas or even apparated there like a wizard for that matter. She certainly didn't meet Tamara again after the two met in Parma. Escape from the Soviet Regime If you don't know anything about Tamara, you may suspect something was wrong with her mental health, like the subject of the book and the movie A Beautiful Mind by the Nobel Award winner economist John Nash. It was not some sort of marketing ploy either to mythicize the painting as Tamara decided to never sell the portrait of the Supreme Mother. Instead, she later donated it to the Museum of Fine Arts in Non, the first ever museum to purchase her art. But if you peered into her career, a constant motif emerges. Tamara loved to create fables around her paintings, whether it be the Mother Superior, which she and her second husband both considered her best work, or be it Tamara in a green Bugatti the auto portrait, which is considered her most iconic work by popularity and peer reviews. I mean, Bugatti, who doesn't love a good Bugatti? In the portrait, she showed herself driving a green Bugatti as the icon of female power and future. But in reality, she owned a yellow Renault. She always had a tale to talk about those paintings, whether imaginary or real, and not only for money. For her, her art transcended the canvas, perhaps an element of her life that bled into her art as well. 
She forged the documents to say that she was born in Warsaw and not in Moscow because she wanted to show herself as less privileged than she was and at the same time she wanted to alienate herself from the communist regime she detested as much as she would end up detesting Italian and German fascism. She was born Tamara Rosalia Gerwig Gorska to a Jewish lawyer father and a bourgeois Catholic mother. Yes, she was Catholic and wealthy from a mother's side only. Her Jewish ancestry was one reason why she escaped Europe in 1939. Now, although Tamara described that her parents divorced, the reality was perhaps rather grim. It's believed that her father disappeared when she was 11 and probably took his own life soon after. Her mother tried to send her to a boarding house in Switzerland, but she faked illness to get out of there. The only thing that ever inspired her was art. Her mother ordered a painting of her and her sister from a well-known neighborhood painter when she was 10. Now, she didn't like the pose the painter chose for her and was utterly displeased with the final product. So, she grabbed the pastel instead, asked her sister to pose for her, and created her first portrait. Or that's what Tamara told everyone. After Switzerland, Tamara moved to St. Petersburg where she took drawing classes at the Academy of Fine Arts. A few years later, she met her first husband, Tadeusz Delimpiki, a distinguished attorney who also happened to be Polish. There was a slight problem though. They married on the eve of Red October, and Tadeusz happened to be a czarist. As a result, he was picked up by the Bolsheviks in the middle of the night, and the lawyer proved quite incompetent to talk his way out of detention. Tamara not only organized ways to get them out of the USSR, but also scoured jails and had to provide favors to Soviet intelligence officers and a Swedish consul to get her husband out on parole so they could escape the country. Breaking into art and breaking up with Limpicky. Even though they made it to Paris, their marriage had taken some serious hits. With Tadeusz being fully dependent on Tamara, who had to compromise a lot to help her husband out, the cracks had begun to appear. In Paris, things didn't change much either. Tadeusz proved severely incapable of securing acceptable employment, and after their child Cosette was born in 1919, Tamara once more turned towards art to make ends meet with an extra mouth to feed. She studied under André Lotte and Maurice Denis, and her early works were mostly portraits of her daughter Cosette. Her first artwork was sold through the gallery Colette Ville, which allowed her to participate in the Salon aux Dépendants. We say independence over here. In 1922, she made her debut appearance in the Salon du Ton. But her big break happened in 1925 with the International Exhibition of Modern Decorative and Industrial Arts. All of her 28 paintings had a strong feminist tone. They were bold, they were provocative, and they were seemingly inspired by her own multiple affairs and carnal parties she was having as the left bank bohemian in Paris, much to her husband's disapproval. With popularity, she also found success. Her subjects mostly modeled bare and yet female wives of rich industrialists and female aristocrats ordered their portraits in bulk, insisting she paint them life-size. Tamara was painting nearly 12 hours a day, with bare necessities like champagne, a massage, and a bath. Her popularity was multiplying, and yet certain critics were reluctant to give her enough credit. She was called the propagator of the perverse paintings, even though there were many male painters also dabbling in the provocative subjects for their art. These critics also questioned her relationship with other women and how it reflected in her art. In 1928, soon after her first husband and Tamara officially separated, she was commissioned by the German magazine Die Dame to do a painting for their cover. Tamara at that time was working under a contract for Dr. Pierre Bucard and his wife, who owned some of her most controversial and sensational paintings. Because of them, she was able to afford a three-story house and studio on Rue Michat that was refurbished by Robert Millet Stevens, the most brilliant French modernist designer of his time. This was pretty much the ultimate urban apartment back then. The end for Tamara. After divorcing her first husband, Tamara had many more secret lovers as she moved across Europe to take on commissions. During her return to Italy, she met a new suitor, Marchese Somme Piccinardi, who asked her to visit Gabriella De Nunzio, a well-known Italian poet and playwright at his estate at Lake Garda. Though Tamara visited him twice, Piccinardi seemingly was more interested in her than her craft. But apparently Tamara had heard that the man was unfortunately suffering from an infectious disease and thus she steered clear from his proposition unhappily. The Great Depression had very little effect on her popularity and work despite the fact that her earnings in America were defaulted as the bank holding her earnings failed after the stock market crash. Don't you hate it when that happens? Around this time, she was hired by Raoul Kuffner, a relatively new nobility under the reign of Franz Joseph I of Austria-Hungary. She was commissioned to paint a portrait of his mistress, Nana Diarreta, a dancer from Spain. 
By the time the painting was finished, she had replaced Nana as Kuftra's mistress, and she married the Baron in 1934, a year after his first wife died. The Baron also adopted Cosette as his own daughter. In the 1940s, after moving to Los Angeles, her frantic social lifestyle and her craft earned her new popularity among Hollywood stars of the day. But her Art Deco style fell out of trend for post-war American abstract expressionism. She tried to follow the trend, but her work lost whatever critical acclaim she had earned, and even interest faded. But her contribution to the history of art is still significant and worth remembering. Thanks for watching Nutty History. Please like and share the video if you enjoyed it. Do subscribe and ring the bell for more videos like this in the future.